Intel's control in nature has new highs. They don't want us to tell you that this is called an LGA 1800 socket, which you can see right there, LGA 18XX. And the best part is that's actually LGA 1700, and that's a socket cover that's been out for a few years now. This is the LGA XX socket. And you can read the name of the socket on the socket. So I just, I just, we're only filming this insert at the beginning uh, because I want Intel to know that MSI did their best. They asked me not to say LGA 18XX. They did follow the rules, um, but the rules are stupid and I rejected them because uh, 1800 has been known for a very long time now. So, but wait, there's more. Intel also says that we can't say the name of the next chipset. Now, I haven't been told the name of the next chipset, so it's a mystery. And that must only be because it is so truly revolutionary, mind-blowing technology. I mean, where will they go next with the names? They've gone from i3s and i5s to core ultras. They've gone from 10 nanometer to Intel 7, rebranding numbers as we know them. And now we don't even know where Intel could go next with the chipset naming. It's just, if only there were some kind of hint on the internet out there about what it could possibly be called, but we'll just have to wait and see. So there's a few motherboard problems to talk about today. We're at Computex 2024. Intel and AMD both have new chipsets coming out. This is known at this point, and they're gonna be in the same naming series. They're both in the 800 series, but that is not the only motherboard challenge to talk about. One of them is that actually, if you look at this button here, so this is a PCIe quick release of sorts, but this is MSI's. Asus also has one of these. And Asus was one of the first, if not the first, to ship a quick release for video cards in a motherboard. What I'm told by MSI is that Asus apparently has a patent in at least Taiwan for a quick release on video cards, which is why you didn't just see them erupt on every board everywhere because uh, they were IP protected. So anyway, that's, it's a really interesting angle. It's why it's taken so long for other board vendors to jump on board, make a version of it. And that's because they had to figure out a new way to do it. All right, so we've got AMD boards to talk about. We have Intel boards. Uh, MSI has a cooler that has moved specifically the, uh, the bracket. So the, the mounting bracket will shift to the cold plate to contact a different area of Intel CPU to try and better accommodate the hotspots. So that's something we'll talk about too. And they've got a case. But the maybe most interesting thing is that Intel has prescribed a special socket cover with a special Intel logo. It's a very high print resolution. They did an excellent job uh, with their unevenly cut acrylic plate and three of four screws. So we can't quite get there. Uh, I'm not allowed to look at the socket directly, but we can infer quite a few things just from looking at this setup. And uh, this is going to be in the known and established LGA 1800 lineup, which is following the LGA 1700 that we've had for a while. So you've probably seen on the socket covers over the years, LGA 1700 slash 18XX, and that's what this talks about. But we'll get started with some of the features and also the cam memory module. Let's start with the socket cover. So this always kind of triggers alarm bells for me when uh, the CPU vendors have certain mandates for what can be shown at a trade show. So because we have restricted access here, the, the things to infer are that Intel is covering specifically, they want the socket protector in there, but they're not covering the whole ILM. And I, I look just at the ILMs we have here, and this is a 1700 once, so this is an existing board, I think this is a Z790 board. There's not really any differences I can physically see without more accurate measurement tools. It's so like this latch is a little different, but that's not an Intel thing. I noticed this is on uh, some of the other MSI boards as well in the 800 series. So that's not the difference, which leaves me to think that because we can't, we're not given access to this, uh, I'm thinking that if Intel is trying to address the well-known bending and tension problem, which there have been rumors over the years now that they're trying to address, then the place to address it is probably gonna be these two pieces of metal right here, but uh, we cannot look at the 1800 series socket, so I don't actually know, but that's my best guess. And then we'll get, to, we'll get the fun of trying to see if, uh, 
if, if that comment aged well or not whenever they launched the 1800 series. So anyway, that's what I would suspect. Moving on from the Intel socket. So some of the MSI stuff. MSI, uh, last we showed their Project Zero boards, and now they've got the PCIe quick release. So you can see this push button here. Very simple mechanism. I mean, all the board vendors are trying to figure out how to uh, add some kind of value. And lately, the way to do it is ease of installation. Now, these have definitely grown on me over the years since they launched, since we first used them in the Asus boards. Because the video cards are so massive now, and the back plates are big enough, as many of you know, it's hard to get in here and push the normal release that's part of the spec. So this is a natural progression. MSI has an icon above the button that changes to let you know the current lock state of it. It is a spring-loaded mechanism. Uh, if I remember correctly, I think Asus uses a cable. So in here, you can see there's a little coil spring, and that's how this one functions. And that just pushes the latch to lock the card into place or release it. So that's one of the things that MSI has added on the ease of installation front, uh, which seems to be kind of the, the main area to improve these days. They've also, as Mike pointed out, uh, have seven segment displays on most of these boards. I think all we don't have prices on any of these boards. These are all, um, for the most part, 800 series boards we're looking at, other than a 790 over here. Uh, so uh, they, they all, to me, look like 200 plus dollar boards, but at least there's seven segments on them. This one, so the ease of installation feature they've added here is in the M.2 slot that we're going to look at. So uh, you can see here there's this basically little uh, metal tab that also functions like a spring quick release mechanism right there. So this can pull up and pops out, which reveals this set of hooks to hook into down here if you look at these tabs. So that grabs these tabs. Uh, and then on the other side, there's this plate, which just has a ton of screws in it, but there's no reason you take those out. And that is what retains the simple spring. So the whole point of this is to eliminate the 20 screws you sometimes have had to take out for heat sink covers. Uh, it's small stuff, you know, it's, it's small ease of installation features. But under that, the other thing MSI is working on is M.2 quick release, where here the uh, drive actually has this toggle that pushes to the side, and that's what locks it into place. So when you uh, push the drive in, it just snaps, and then that locks into place. So that's kind of, that's the big news. It's, <laughs> it's patent protected ease of installation features. That's the state of the motherboard industry. Um, call it patent trolling if you want, but at the end of the day, if you've ever wondered Gee, I wonder why other motherboard vendors don't do something that this one did. It's not only because it's all locked behind IP. Uh, so kind of an interesting, uncommonly discussed tactic of the motherboard side of the industry. A CAM is another interesting point. So that is this module here, where this is a CAM2 memory module. The density is very high on these. And there's a couple key advantages. Uh, there's also some key disadvantages. So you can see. Obviously, normal memory module slots are not here, like for DDR5. And instead, you have this uh, pin array that in some ways is familiar to, say, an LGA socket, where uh, now the motherboard vendors have a massive RMA nightmare from the memory, and users need to be careful of it. But the advantage is actually we'll have the tally swivel around here, and we'll show this whiteboard. Now, I asked, uh, I asked the engineer from MSI to help present this, but he's camera shy, so I'm going to do it. Uh, so this is traditional DDR5, this is CAM2. The difference is that because the trace length has to be equal going to the memory module, there's areas where they'll have to double up the traces or run basically intentionally longer traces to get equivalent length uh, so that they can maintain the signal and they can hit the frequencies and times that they want to hit. Now with CAM, uh, everything moves a little bit closer, and from what they're telling me, it's easier to engineer the solution uh, for the actual trace routing to the memory, which then allows an easier to hit higher frequency and apparently easier to maintain tighter timings. So that's supposed to be the advantage of this. Uh, density is the other big advantage, but the downside is maybe somewhat obvious that for those who are more enthusiasts, 
you lose the option to just drop in a memory module or two if you want to expand later. So there is no buy two, add two later with the way CAM is built right now, at least on this board that we have in front of us for desktop. You buy your unit, install it, and then if you wanted to upgrade to a higher uh, capacity later, you buy another one and uh, either create waste or uh, you know, secondhand sell it. Now these also have a wider form factor that they don't have here to show us, but this seats down on top of this plastic guide pen right there, and then there's five screws to hold it all in place. Uh, this can also run longer out to this spot here for higher density modules. I'm not sure the exact, uh, the point at which that would be necessary. Now this for cooling has its own massive uh, cover now, just like every like the M.2 devices. It's not finned, I don't know. I, I asked about numbers for how much power it's really handling or what kind of thermal targets they need to hit, and we don't have any information yet. It's, it's still very new, uh, but this is what sits on top of the, um, the CAM module. So that kind of walks through the boards. Uh, for the chipsets, so it's all the same familiar naming. It's going to be 890 and whatever else Intel does. On AMD, it's going to be 870E, 870, and AMD is still going to be going for two chipsets for the 870E, and then everything else is still the single chipset, just like it is now. It's just you iterate the numbers. All right, so that covers all the boards. For the other stuff MSI has, uh, the cooler is mostly interesting to me for two reasons. One, the, there's going to be a mounting kit that shifts where the pressure is applied on the cold plate. So we've talked about this in our cooler reviews. We're moving the uh, contact patch and the highest point of pressure will heavily influence the thermals. We talked about that in our video where we worked with Scythe to engineer basically a golden sample cold plate. So that is that kit's supposed to move it 10 millimeters higher on Intel. And my understanding, this isn't this uh, this is not Intel, but let's just use it for example. So my understanding is that the mounting point typically would have the highest pressure here, and the special kit moves it up like kind of northeast to about here, if this were Intel. Uh, it's gonna collide with some VRM heat sinks, but that's the idea. For the rest of this, it's got a rotatable display, which MSI tells us is supposed to match the current theme of cut corner cases popularized by height. And the biggest thing I don't like about this is the singular fan unit. So the downside to that is just massive amounts of unnecessary waste if a fan ever dies. So if one of these dies, I ask, there is not a way to just replace one. The way it is right now, it's a 360. They're all one piece. And if that one fails, you're throwing the whole thing away and replacing it, which is unfortunate. Uh, and is, uh, you know, it's, it's gonna be an RMA problem. Obviously the goal is to not have fans fail, but fans always at some point will fail just from dust. So anyway, that's the cooler. That is the, uh, the core liquid P series. And then there's a case over here. So this is the uh, Velox 300R airflow case. The reason this is interesting really in any capacity is gonna be if we look at this fan in here, and the front fans are larger versions of this. So this has got like a dual blade approach where you see there's that inner fan and an outer fan. Uh, they spin in unison, so they're not disconnected. And uh, this is something you've seen on video cards before probably. Uh, I personally haven't, I can't think of a time I've seen it in a case. It seems like something AeroCool would have done at some point. But uh, that's gonna be the main kind of marketing point for these. There is no data for them right now. I've asked for kind of PQ and other information. There's nothing yet. But what they did sh do was show us a quick video that just animates and renders how it's supposed to work. And the idea is that it forms, in theory, almost more of a tornado of air coming out of the fan uh, that then diffuses at the back end and it's supposed to just direct it more in a straight path. So if it works as is described, the theoretical upside is that if you have a fan up front and it's able to direct that air in a, as straight a path as possible, you're gonna have a lot better time getting it straight into a cooler than if it's more diffuse. Uh, so that would be beneficial, especially to air coolers at a longer distance, something like this, where in some of our case reviews, you see that the shorter the case, the better the, the cooling performance on the CPU. Uh, so the front's got 160s, which is pretty interesting. The Antec C8 ARGB also uses 160s, but they're in the bottom. So, and then a Lee and Lee Land Cooler is one case with 160s. Generally speaking, 160s have been a really effective form factor for fans. So you get to use more area, but you're not going as wide as something like a 180, which blows out the proportions of the case. 
And you also now start to have new problems uh, where you require uh, more expensive fans to make sure the blades don't explode. So that's kind of the, the main points of the case. Now, the airflow side, I'm still not a big fan of the approach for this. Um, I, I am very interested in the fans themselves, but the panel we've been talking about for years, MSI is slowly improving with this. Uh, still has some problems, though, with just low porosity and a really high kind of density of plastic intermixed with that mesh behind it. That's going to block a lot of the ventilation. So they can improve here. I would love to see something like this with the 160s with an ultra fine mesh instead. Something like you might find, I'm trying to see if there's an example here, on a Fantex case or really most modern cases where uh, it's a rigid version of this. I mean, this is a dust filter, but if you have a rigid metal version of that on the front panel instead, performance is going to be much better. It also filters the dust and then you get to benefit from those, in theory, 160 fans. So um, that'd be what I'd like to see. No price on this yet. Looking like a Q4 launch for that one. Maybe we'll review it in our updated case benchmarks. But otherwise, the main stuff was the cooler with the hotspot shifting and the screen being angled, and then uh, kind of going over some of the motherboard uh, ecosystem, I guess, right now, or, or landscape, where um, everyone's kind of trying to vie for different ease of installation features in their own way, which is a good thing. It's just, you kind of look at the big picture and since there's a patents blocking development of things like a latched release of video card, it moves slowly sometimes. So MSI has got some updates there, but that's it for this one. Thanks for watching, subscribe for more as always. Check out the rest of our Computex coverage. We're gonna have a ton of videos this week and next and we'll see you in the next video.